And action. <laughs> and what was that bit? <laughs> That's been sweet so many times. And action. Action. Ready? And action. Welcome to Behind the Slate, everybody. I am Aaron Strand, and I am joined by an incredible, amazing guest. Tara Oaks is an actor, writer, comedian, and producer. Her numerous film credits include The Mom in the viral Adult Swim short Too Many Cooks, as well as real-life civil rights pioneer Viola Liuzzo in the Academy Award-nominated film Selma. After this film, she wrote and developed an amazing one-woman show about her experience playing Viola titled White Woman in Progress that my wife still talks about to this day. She is a longtime teacher and company member of the Atlanta-based improv comedy theater Dad's Garage. She is the head of development at Dagger Originals, and she is best known in the nerd community as Greta Gerthammer in the popular stage show <laughs> Improvised Dungeons and & Dragons. And... She is the only friend of mine to make a fart joke and talk about nonviolent strategy in a single sentence. Tara Oaks. Hello. I'm trying to think of a fart joke. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> SPD. All right. Hi. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. So happy that you're here. Very first <laughs> guest on Behind the Slate. How does this it feel? This is really exciting. I'm a big fan of your podcast, Aaron. Wow. I did. I really like it. I, I have some notes. Um, <laughs> just kidding. here on the show. What? <laughs> please, please tell me your notes. No, I don't have any notes. You were. It's really entertaining. It's long. The one thing <laughs> is, it's really long. But you and I have been working together for so long now that I feel like this is your dream medium because you can go as long as you want. That's true. It's not more expensive, right? Like film. Well, this is what I say. What I always say to people when they bring up the length of the show is, listen, like they make <laughs> they make a pause button for a reason. You know what I, I mean? Well, I think that's really true because I've actually the way I listen to your podcast, I'll, I'll listen to it in chunks and then I'll pause and I'll go back and I'll re-listen to some of it because it's just so dense. There's just so many ideas. There's so much information that it's almost like you could listen to it and then re-listen to it and hear new things. Let me ask you this right off the bat. Have you ever seen a Charlie Chaplin film before? I haven't. I don't think I've seen a whole Chaplin film, but I've got to have seen dozens and dozens of clips throughout my lifetime. Yeah. Because I feel like it gets plugged into every, I don't know, retrospective or biography or, or just a commercial. Like, they'll use clips Whatever I don't I I feel like I've you it's it's iconic you can't it kind of is everywhere now. If you've seen a Looney Tunes cartoon, yeah, you've watched a Chaplin bit because right. they stole all of them. I feel like he's the quintessential physical comedian, yeah. right? So he sort of defined the genre. Absolutely. I mean, I'm I was watching I was reviewing you said um, review the Gold Rush, so I was going back in and just watching through. I mean, it's all Steve Martin. Like it's Steve Martin literally just studied. Chaplin. Yeah. And that's the jerk. And that's every SNL bit he ever did. It's all the, the bun dance. I mean, I feel like I was, yeah, it's all been taken and used, which is fine. Exactly. That's how comedy works. That's how I, I told my students all the time. I'm like, start with an impression. Like, do a walk in. Great. Don't do Cosby. But, you know, like, do impressions <laughs> and practice those voices and that physicality because it's, it's going to be channeled through your body. And your body is a different vessel. So eventually you'll start to make it your own, right? Um, but you teach your body the timing and the physicality and, and the extremes. And then you use that to create your own voice. But it's all, how else are you going to know how to do it? Even if you're just watching like your mom walk around and you sort of exaggerate her movements, everything is observation anyway. What do you think makes comedy hold up over time? I think that's the thing that I'm most blown away about by Chaplin's films is that 100 years later, so many of them still work. And yet we've all had the experience of watching a film or a TV show and then rewatching it 10 years later. And it's like, that didn't really hold up. Well, I think that the stuff that doesn't hold up is referencing a moment in time, like pop culture, uh, or it might be like a satirical point of view um that we sort of grow out of <laughs> hopefully uh but he is tapping into archetypes human archetypes right and and human behaviors that i think we've had since we were animals since before we had consciousness before we had language we had to be able to tell some 
other creature in front of us that you were mad or scared, right? So that that universal language that we have amongst humans and amongst animals, so like in the gold rush, if he's eating the shoe um, and he's satisfied, like you don't need words to be able to understand that satisfi- satisfaction. And then, of course, the juxtaposition of um, the unexpected. That's sort of the a brand of comedy that he's known for. Uh, so he has this quote from studying comedy or learning comedy in the music halls of London, right? And he says, I had stumbled on the secret of being funny. An idea going in one direction meets an opposite idea and suddenly, ha ha, you shriek, it works every time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, well, I, every time when I'm teaching my students, it's always about, um, you know, taking something that you are familiar with and placing it in the unfamiliar. And I'll tell them things like, um, you know, it's either a weird person in a normal world or a normal person person in a weird world right so it's always a juxta- juxtaposition of two um unlike ideas sort of mashed together and then you discover something amazing from that something human something something insightful so there's a little bit of the element of surprise um but i think his is rewatchable just because he's so precise there's not a wasted moment and it's all the simplest little steps right so it's not even like, oh, he's doing it in threes or whatever. It's just it's just taking an idea and just twisting it just a little bit and then a little bit more and then adding one more element. And that you, you start to feel the pattern with him and that's play. That's what kids do, right? That's how they that's how they play. They play they they'll repeat something over and over again and they'll add new things and just the joy of that idea that they're they're playing with. Especially his work with objects, mm. his object work, right? Yeah. Be- because his ability to transmute the physical world from one thing to another, right? Like using the shoe bit, right? So we have... Sh- <laughs> I we was have- sitting there like, okay, what'd they make the shoe out of? Because they are eating it. It's licorice. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, and they... and he, I, thought, I was like, it's not fruit roll-ups because they didn't have that back then, but it kind of looks like a fruit roll-up. It's black licorice and he and Max Swain, uh, so they had to shoot it, I think, over 50 times and it gave them horrible diarrhea. Oh. So they'd be running off set, <laughs> shitting in a bathroom, <laughs> both of them, and, then, oh and then having to go back and he'd say, all right, it's Let's time to eat, it a, again. eat another shoe. <laughs> Which makes it even more joyful because they know what they're doing to themselves and they're pretending they enjoy it. Yeah. But like his little touch of, uh, you know, he t- taking the shoe out, you know, like you doing the whole like turkey routine. But right. I think the one of the most delightful details is when he takes the, the shoe strings off, mm. like spaghetti right and he uses the two forks to fork it onto a plate just like spaghetti and yeah. then he twirls it on his fork and <laughs> yeah he's well i'm he treats each item like it's something else in the world and uh, you know like the turkey breast and then the little um the little nails are like the bones that you're cleaning and right. oh it's just so succulent that you're like sucking the meat off of it. it's so gross <laughs> um yeah but he he also to me like what works great about that bit is everything is about his his relationship to what's the char- other character oh big jim mckay yeah, yeah big jim so it's it's all about his relationship to big jim you know because everything he does he sort of perform you could his character is sort of performing this ritual in order to sell the idea that the shoe is going to be a meal right so it's so it's not just the shoe's a meal but hey man eat this shoe with me like this could be delicious and he's like look you know and he's uh so he's doing the of course we would never to me like he when he took the shoelace off it was like this is the part you don't do that gets set to the side (laughs) you know it was set to the side and then um you know and then he like separates the leather from the sole and and he hands the other guy the sole and he's like no i don't want that they're, they're like arguing over who gets the best pieces and all of a sudden his friend is part of the game Right. And so then it's becomes like, you know, he's enjoying it. Uh, But the other guy's like, "Mm, all right. (laughs) You know, so it's all about that relationship between the two of them, which I love. That's so that's so true. And it actually something that had totally escaped me, even on this latest rewatch of the film. And I think it really speaks to your work. So Tara is an incredible improv teacher. I've taken her class before. And (laughs) that's right. You can't, um, you really, it's incredibly difficult, almost impossible to do comedy in a vacuum. It's so much about that work with the partner. Yeah. How do you teach that sort of focus and how do you bring comedy out of that partner relationship? I I just try to get people addicted to it because to me, that's the most interesting comedy. And I, 
you know, I can repeat a routine over and over again, uh, like a clowning routine, which is what Chaplin does, right? Opening a door or eating a shoe for dinner. You can repeat these routines over and over again. You can learn them perfectly. Um, and that's fine. But the unknown is the other person, right? And you get so much laughter and joy from the unknown, the unexpected. Um, so to me, I, I, there's a couple of tools I'll give them to sort of tap into the experience of that, like making eye contact. Um, and, you know, there's a, one of the tools we use is to start with like I, you, or we sentences, right? So it's talking about the person as opposed to the activity. You, you, try, to get, you try to use these sort of tricks to get people to start paying attention to each other. And then hopefully that translates into that you sort of fall in love with the idea of getting a response from the other person, getting, you know, get using them as part of your comedy, because that's the part that's out of your control. And therefore, you never know what you, there's always opportunity for more surprises for you to play with. So there's the aspect of the technical perfection of the physicality and the, and the joke concepts. And then there's the unknown of how this other human reacts. And we as an audience love to see people react. And we know in a heartbeat if it's fake, right? Because if the other person, if one actor does something and the other person reacts just a moment too late, or maybe in a way that just doesn't translate with what they've just seen, it's immediately, it immediately takes you out of it. But if you are, we always say in comedy, if you're interested in what you're doing, everybody else will be too. So to me, like, people watching each other and being curious and interested in reacting, that immediately creates that effect. So all of, all, I just try to get them, I just try to get them addicted to it. Like if you can just feel it a couple of times, you'll start to want that versus being alone. Even a stand-up wants it, you know, because they have the audience. Right. They're interacting with a partner mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. The partner in the crowd. Yeah. And crowd work is like some of stand-up's best work is crowd work. When you, when you're performing. Okay. Do you, what, what are you thinking before you go on stage? Because I imagine you're not thinking, all right, got to get out there. Got to be funny. Got to, <laughs> got to make them laugh. I mean, what do you, what kind of mental prep do you do to sort of get out of your head and onto your partner? Uh, for me, the one thing we, we always do warm ups before the show, or we try to, um, and I try to get into a positive mood, right? Like hopeful because to me, comedy is always hopeful. Like you're talking about like with the tramp walking off into the sunset dejected and then he does a little kick at the end. You know, it, it even that, even the tragic sadness, it's like he's still got to be happy. There's still got to be hope. It doesn't have to be happy. There has to be hope. So I try to put myself into a frame of mind of hopefulness versus despair and all is lost, which is also a familiar space for me. So, <laughs> and you know, many comedians. I and think. many comedians, yeah. So either, you know, so we'll be telling jokes and doing bits with each other to kind of get ourselves in that mood, or I'll listen to like comedy podcasts that I think have a good attitude that aren't sarcastic and negative. Um, and then right before the show, I, I mean, it's pretty basic. I just go off into a corner and kind of stretch out and quiet down because all of that, energy all of that sort of frenetic joyful energy then has to get focused into like a laser you know of, and i don't want to lose the energy but i need to ground it so that when i get out there i don't have that panicked experience because the audience picks up on everything they see more than you do the audience is a better performer than you are at all times so anything that you is happening to you they can read it so you don't want to come out with like ah, ah, nervous energy because then they're nervous for you because they're also empathetic, right? They're mirrors. So whatever you feel, they feel. Um, I mean, that's the whole point of theater is to not feel alone. You look at other people feeling and you feel it too. And you get to go through that process safely under, under the masterful <laughs> you know, control of a performer so that you get to have all of those experiences and not feel alone um, without actually having to you know, be in a house that's falling off a cliff, <laughs> you know? I think it's so interesting how the audience is always, it's, they're so much more forgiving than you as a performer often think they are. 
like they are rooting for you. Oh, they're rooting for so you. So hard. I mean, for they sure. paid their money to come see you. Yeah. Like, but yeah. But even if they didn't, even if for some reason you're in a performance space where they didn't, it's human nature to desire the performer to de- like to mm-hmm. want it. They they want you to do it. Like yeah. they're on your side. They're on your side, and they will make a lot of connections that you don't need to make yeah. for them. They. You know, it's like that old film trick of like showing a coffee cup and then showing a car drive away. And immediately you've connected the dots of that story in some way. So the audience is always connecting the dots and telling story to themselves, even as they're watching. They're making story. The second you walk on stage, they're already telling story about you in their minds and categorizing you. And and it's not in like a gross judgmental way. It's to make to familiarize. And it's something that you teach in your improv class so brilliantly that I still think about to oh, this really? day, right? So you talk about <laughs> when you're crafting a story, when you're crafting an, an, improv- an improvised story, mm-hmm. you want to start with a character, right? right? Once upon a time, there was blank. Yeah. And every day they did blank. Yeah. Until one day. Something new happened. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And at the second you walk on stage, the audience is already try- uh, uh, sorting through their this is a dated reference, Rolodex of human mm. information, right? Yep. And they're saying, once upon a time, here came this person that I now right. see. And every day they, they're they waiting for some little nugget to just connect the dot because they need they want to know who you are. The key is, this is the reason I'm showing you this. The reason I'm even on stage is because this matters. So they're already looking to see why. What, what is it? What's important about this? Right. Because the automatic assumption is that it's important. That was why Seinfeld was such a novelty, because the sort of conceit was they're going they're going to talk about nothing. It's a show about nothing. Well, every show is about something. So how could a show possibly be about nothing? And, you know, that was tongue in cheek because it wasn't about nothing. It was about the banalities of life and how important they could be. Right. So um, the way a person walks in the door can become monumentally important. Um, I think Seinfeld probably took from Chaplin, too, because it's like just the simple act of eating can become monumentally important. Every bite, the way you do it tells a billion stories, right? Just the way you pick up the fork tells me how much money you have and um, how you're feeling today and how hungry you are and how many times you've picked up a fork before um, and how safe you feel in this space. There's a billion things that one little movement can tell you. So just by the nature of walking on the stage, we're saying what you're about to see matters in some way. And I think when viewed in that perspective, it really, it totally makes sense why a film from 100 years ago Mm -hmm. or a Shakespeare play from uh, 400 years ago can still resonate with us today. Yeah. Um, I want to read something for you. Okay. Um, Oh, good. Okay. This is is the oldest joke ever recorded. Okay. (laughs) The oldest joke. All right. This is... This is from 4,000 years ago. Wait, what? Written in Sumerian cuneiform. Okay, this oh. is the oldest joke that I've ever oh, been Oh, recorded found. like on the wall. Okay, according, like... to, according to the <laughs> University of Wolverhampton. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's already funny. Founded by Wolverine, of That's course. That's already funny. Uh, in, in England. <laughs> uh, okay, here it goes like this. Quote, something which has never occurred since time immemorial, a young woman who did not fart in her husband's lap. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the question that everyone is dying to know. Wait, what's the first part? What's the setup? <laughs> something that yeah, there's the <laughs> something which has never occurred since time immemorial. A young woman who did not fart in her husband's lap. Something that has not in- occurred since time immemorial. That's such a good setup. The double negative is like is absurd oh well it's like it's sarcasm to me like that setup is what's mo- the most perfect thing about that joke is because it's the juxtaposition of the very formal since time immemorial right so there's this tone of formality and then there's this base language or idea of passing gas right yeah so it's that there's that juxtaposition again that's a, that's a good joke on a number of levels i think it holds up but also Farts are the greatest joke ever. That clearly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a surprise. Always. <laughs> it's human. And it affects everybody. Absolutely. 
anybody who thinks they're above a fart joke is not a friend of mine. And and it's here's what's great about it too is it affects everybody around you is affected negatively, and you, the farter, are always affected positively. <laughs> it's just it's relief, right? It's ah, but everybody else is like ooh, and that's so fun. <laughs> It's so fun. The other thing about it that I think is so funny is that like, okay, I had a uh, improv teacher who would always say kind of exactly what you were talking about Mm. earlier, right? The key to comedy and improv is out of your head into the space, right? Out of your head into the space. Like you want to get into the space. (laughs) (laughs) So I think you see where I'm going with this, right? I love that. The fart is the essential. Out of your butt into the space. Out of your butt into the space. I think that's what they should have been saying. Not out of your head into the space, but out of your butt into the space. Because here's the thing. This is why it's so tricky to teach comedy. Because there's these incredibly high-level theories that are universal and and uh, have been said a bunch of different ways. And there's so many examples of them in the world. But when you are a student walking into a comedy class, all you want is to be funny. You know, like, it's, 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 the word be means it's personal. Like I am or am not this thing and I'm about to find out. And so you walk into a classroom and there's the, you create these stakes for yourself of I want, am I funny or not? This is going to tell me. And then you get phrases like get out of your head and into the space. And you're like, I don't, what do I, how do I do that? You know, like, do I surgically remove my brain and set it in the middle of the rug? Like, how do you (laughs) practically do that? So I'm always balancing giving them practical exercises, right? Just try this thing, test it out. And then and then and then the theory you'll understand it later once you've had the experience. You heard it here first. If you're thinking about going to a comedy <laughs> class or you want to know if you're funny or not, go to a comedy class, walk in, fart and leave. Oh my Tara God. Oaks says you're funny. I've done that before. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that is the height of funny. Um, Can you teach it? Farting? <laughs> no teaching. Do you necessary. know there was this Instagram influencer who started selling her farts, and she would fart in a jar, and then she'd sell it. Uh, this you can see this online, but anyway, the this, cut yeah. to the cut to the best part of this story is she got to the point where she was making so much money off of it that she was trying to generate more farts, and then she made herself sick. <laughs> That's the natural progression. Yes. Right? In in comedy, you're always heightening. It's like, okay, I'm selling a fart. Now I'm now I'm getting rich. So I'm gonna sell more farts. Now I have to figure out how to make more farts. Then I start making myself sick and I get to the doctor and he's like, You have to stop <laughs> farting. <laughs> but in a way, that story also perfectly illustrates the relationship between comedy and tragedy because yes. <laughs> at some point it tipped over to where it's like, she flew too close to the sun. Right. Well, and it's also <laughs> it's not like a gross you know, a a gross person farting. It's a beautiful, elegant person farting, right? So it's just like the Sumerian joke. It's like, it's a young lady farting on her husband's lap. Right. You know, she's the height of desirable. And then she's like, kablam. <laughs> <laughs> Juxtaposition of opposite ideas. Getting back to comedy, like, can do you think you, it can be taught? Or do you think? I think everyone is inherently funny. Humor is subjective. And you also need to be in a place to receive it. I think the best laughers are people that can see joy and humor in everybody. It's really tapping into what do you find funny and what do you find joy in? And can you release all of the stuff around you that says you're not allowed to behave this way? It's possible because at the core of everybody is a child that's hilarious and adorable. Think about it, like literally every kid has funny videos of themselves, right? Like it, at this point. Um, so, you know, like you can watch a kid and they crack you up. It's just like you watch an animal and they crack you up. It's, it's not about um, being clever. It's about being perfectly human without unfettered. So that's what I do is I help them get rid of the fetters. <laughs> I had a teacher once. Um give me what I thought was the best definition of comedy that I've ever heard. Oh, good. It wasn't me. It wasn't you. (sighs) But you can steal this. I will. They said, uh, comedy is the shameless pursuit of an objective. Hmm. And I... I, Man, I was really hoping you were going to say the shameless pursuit of joy. Well, 
I mean, I don't know if that I, I don't know if that's the case because shameless <laughs> pursuit of an objective. I could walk on stage going, "Oh, I'm so happy!" Like, and that probably wouldn't be funny. I'm ashamed of you right now. Thank you, but <laughs> <laughs> but that isn't. But that's. But you even what you just did right now had an affectation of this is stupid. I feel ashamed of this idea. Um, I don't really feel joy. So I think that to me is there is something in that. No, seriously, like. It, the second you are judging yourself, then it's not, it's no longer fun, right? That's part of it. But I, th- I like the shameless pursuit of an objective. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll give it, to, I'll say, okay, maybe it's the best definition. Oh, wow. Like, jury's um, I, <laughs> but I, I actually am thinking of a time in, uh, in your improv class where you gave a direction of, I don't remember what you said, but like be free or something like that. Mm, I walked on stage and something, something like that, (laughs) but I walked on stage and like just started rolling around on the floor, like saying like how happy I was very self, uh, 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 without any shame. Mm -hmm. And you literally stopped the scene and said, Aaron, you need to stop and (laughs) and pull (laughs) pull this back. Um, Ah, yes. And I've been scarred ever since. Yeah. Good. Good. Don't ever pull that shit with me. (laughs) Um, yeah, I, you know, like to me, there is something sort of mocking and satirical and like, uh, you know, trying to prove a point, you know, as opposed to, and I probably translated it to that, even if it wasn't, that's probably what I translated it to is like, I'm like, just let it go play. And so you were like, fuck you, I'm going to play. I was like, all right, dipshit, get out of here. I don't think I, don't think I was playing at you. Or like no, a, you probably weren't. I, listen, here's the thing I, I, I wish I could be a little bit less embarrassed by and a little more clear with my students on. I am not perfect at this. And every, every, class t- every time I come into a class, I'm bringing in my own attitudes. And if I'm not feeling trustful of people, I will absolutely misinterpret something. Or absolutely um, assume the negative uh, intention of a student when it's not there because I've got some shit in my head right now, you know. So teachers aren't definitely not perfect, as you can see. I'm insanely jealous of some other teacher getting the best definition of comedy out of me. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're just we're more humans. But at the same time, you also can't yes and your way through life. You know, I think many people have tried to bring some philosophy mm. of improv like in out of the theatrical Ooh. space and into life. Yeah. And I think people yes and their way into, you know, maniacal conspiracy theory. They yes and their way into uh, really problematic behavior. And mm. as functioning humans, like we need to have some parameters, some ability to judge right and wrong. Yeah, I think people misunderstand the concept of yes and as a life philosophy because so many people come into improv class look here's the where that came from people come into improv class and they you know we say well yes and is essentially the uh, the core uh directive of improv you accept other people's ideas and you add your own that's it yes and that's what you're doing sort of the simplest version of it and then they come into these classes and they they feel they it starts to affect their lives. They feel start to feel better. They they kind of drink the Kool Aid, and it's because they're in a space where they're being accepted, and trusted, and allowed to be, and allowed to fail without being devastated by it. And this is a very unique space, and it's critical for the creative space. And I do think it translates as an idea into life. Um, but people get literal about it and they, and they, and they get, uh, when, whenever you take a philosophy and it becomes your manifesto, the only rule of life, that's, you've, you've missed the point because yes, and is a, a philosophy for being creative. And the way it translates into life is when you consider the possibility that other people have information that's true and useful, right? Uh, and then you want to add your voice to that world of ideas. So you're trying to accept people um, as they are and who they are. That doesn't mean that you whole cloth believe whatever anybody says. It doesn't mean that you say yes to every opportunity. No. If somebody says, here, do bad drugs, then say no. You know, if somebody says, hey, let's go rob a bank, please say no. 
if somebody says, hey, I'm going to stab you in the stomach, please say no. Like there are Yes isn't about literally saying the word yes. It's about accepting other people, people who could be very different than you. And to me, when somebody's going off into wild conspiracy theories because they've said yes to one idea, by its very nature, a conspiracy theory says no to everything else. No, there's no other answers. Only my answer is the yes. And that's, you've defeated it. So to me, like that when people go into toxic positivity land, and those kind of things, it's, that's when you get defeated. Okay, but just to yeah. summarize, just say no to drugs. <laughs> All right, okay. Yes and doesn't mean yes to everything. Yes, <laughs> yeah. It's a concept. If the, next st- if, the, if the next words after yes and are Hunter Biden, stop. Oh, no, we can't be political. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I already you, de- you have to be careful about That was my note for your podcast is be careful about inserting um, a derogatory opinion of a popular culture thing that may or may not be like when you were like, um, SNL sucks. I was like, that's fine for you to believe that, but you are creating a film podcast in which you're trying to let everybody have access to appreciation of film. If you then turn around and shit on something, it, it suddenly creates like a sort of a, um, uh, like a snobbery around something. You're right. That a lot of people might like. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Uh, because that is, that's a snobby opinion. You know, that's like a snobby <laughs> opinion. Yeah. There's definitely, I mean, they've literally, there's no way you can say SNL sucks. It's literally a bastion of comedic um, enterprise for the last, what, 40, almost up to 40 years now. And during which time, I mean, like it started in the 70s and they are cranking out live sketch shows once a week, 30 weeks of the year, however many weeks of the year, massive live productions. And they've been doing this for how many years? It's an unbelievable achievement. Whether every single sketch is funny or where there's periods of time when it's not funny, I like to me, that's irrelevant because it's not all going to be brilliant funny. It can't, it's, it can't be. Chaplin had to do his tramp routine a hundred times in front of a hundred different audiences before he got it right, you know? So like to crank out live sketch shows every single week, these guys are surgical in terms of their level of skill. And that doesn't mean it's going to all be brilliant comedy, but I mean, it has generated some of the greatest comedians of our time. It's generated some of the best sketches of our time. You know, some of the best jokes, some of the best characters. It's undeniable in its contribution. And to be honest, that is all. It is. It was my childhood dream to be on Saturday Night Live, and I never <gasps> came close Everybody's to Everybody's dream, right? Yeah, because I loved it. Sounds amazing. And I've grown old and bitter, and my old bitterness oh my came, seeped in to the script. And you're right. And I owe Lauren Michaels a six-part series now. Um, He doesn't need anything from anybody. (laughs) And he will be the first to tell you if it sucks. And I'm sure there were plenty of weeks where he was like, this sucked, or however you do a Lauren Michaels impression. Yeah. You know? like Yeah. But he he definitely has the authority to make that call. Um, But yeah, I also realized as an aging comedian that I probably dodged a bullet because that is one of the hardest jobs in show business. Oh, for sure. It's insane. And the pressure levels could not be higher. Yeah. I... I guess what I want to ask you about is I sort of shift the conversation a little bit because I know you got really dramatic, like, and now we're going to move on to some hard topics. Well, okay. Let me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> let me offset that by sharing my favorite fart joke from history. <laughs> there was a scandal that what? you were involved in recently involving farts. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Uh, but in all seriousness, my favorite fart joke from history is from Shakespeare's Twelfth Night and Sir Toby Belch. The Classic. comedic character, the mouth he, fart. He uh he 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 eats too much and he mm-hmm. drinks too much. Yep. And he walks in on stage, and it's not in the stage directions, but he's making a big ruckus, and the other characters are trying to stop him. And then he just has a line that says, "Fie these pickled herring." Okay, <laughs> that's the line. No direction. <laughs> but the best way that I've ever seen it done is he's making this big to do the all the other characters basically tackle him and are trying to subdue him from 
from from attacking another character or whatever mm -hmm. and all of them in synchronization then recoil and back away yes and you know what happened and he says fie on these pickled herring <laughs> <laughs> that's so good now i can never imagine that scene in any other way that's perfect greatest fart joke in history that's perfect but seriously but seriously let's i think you let's bring it down <laughs> God damn it, Dara. <laughs> this is my first uh, time hosting an interview, and you're really throwing me off. Can you yes and to my host? Is it going well? <laughs> Should what? I? I'm going to go to your next comedy show. Do you? And I'm going to ask you mid performance oh. Is it going well? Oh, I dare you. See, that's what I mean by sarcasm. Like, there's a, there's a little piece of that that just feels too true to laugh at. Like there, you do worry about is this going well? I worry about is this going. Well? Yeah, of course, it's terrifying. So we can I, either cry or we can laugh. I, I feel like <laughs> this is going terribly in my heart. Really? Well, you're doing amazing, but I feel, no, I'm it's, no, I'm not thinking about you. I'm thinking about me, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> of course, no, you get self consciously afraid. <laughs> um, no, you're fantastic, but I see, yeah. and I don't believe you. I think I'm screwing up and you are covering up. This is so, I love humans so much. We just, we, we just eat ourselves alive and it's great because it's, uh, everybody does it. Everybody does it. They do. But I do think that performers and comedians in particular mm. are often very susceptible to this sort of thinking. I mean, it, it, you, you start to have patterns uh, and when you're putting yourself out there in performance over and over and over again, those patterns can become very well hewn. And oftentimes people are drawn to the performing arts and drawn to comedy mm -hmm. to offset and compensate something that they feel in their heart, right? Like yeah. people don't write books about like how to uh, meditate every day unless they've like really struggled with meditating every day. You know what I mean? <laughs> so people yeah. don't make jokes unless they've usually have experienced some kind of sadness or, or or pain in their lives I, comedians are broken people is what i'm trying to say <laughs> <laughs> that's okay okay that's the trope that you have to go through some kind of tragedy in order to do comedy right but see then that becomes a barrier to entry because somebody will say well i haven't suffered enough um in order to have to be a good comedian and i have to have a shitty life in order to be a good comedian yeah <laughs> like i'd just rather have a good life and then people will actively make their lives shittier well and in, then in, yeah in believing that it will somehow make them funnier and they just become worse and worse I people i wonder is there really anybody out there that's like i'm going to make myself have a shitty life so i could be a great comedian i think, I think absolutely great no i think that comedians get into the space where there's a lot of darkness and alcohol and drugs and uh, you know, it's a nightlife and, and it's very competitive and it can make that pressure can kind of create monsters. Um, but I don't think that you have to have a bad life to be a good comedian. I think that you, I think that great comedians are great observers of people. So a lot of times that can be someone who's suffered, who's had tragedy. Because, you know, like if it's a child that's been abused, they become experts at observing and, uh, and, and interpreting the moods of their abuser, right? So comedians have vulnerability and they have observational powers that are heightened. They become very good at recognizing the moods and expressions and behaviors of other people. And then you're able to comment on that or you're able to present it like Chaplin's able to look at the drunk or, or look at the tramp or, or look at the forlorn lover. And then he's able to replicate that because he's an incredible observer. He's also a very vulnerable person. So that vulnerability, that exposing yourself on stage um, has a, a fascination to it, right? But I don't think you have to suffer in order to be a comedian. You do need to be very good at observing other people. Oh, I love that. I think that that's so much more permissive and so much more right? open. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because I mean, it, it... okay, good. Because I've had a really good blessed life. <laughs> it's been really good. And think about how much funnier you'd be if you were miserable. I... <laughs> 
you know, it's think how much funnier I'd be if I had a penis. Like women. <laughs> oh, wow. See, so here's the thing. It, the whole trope of women aren't funny, which I think is really past its prime now as far as a, an opinion. Um, but I think that the validity of it was in the fact that for so long in society, in order to be funny, you have to expose yourself and be vulnerable. And that's really dangerous for women. We, for so long, needed to be submissive, to be seen and not heard, to, uh, you know, to, to keep our voices quiet in order to be accepted, right? So you were polite, you were a lady, you, were, you behaved yourself. And all of that is not conducive to comedy. Comedy is about misbehaving and, and, um, and speaking the truth that others don't want to hear. And for a long time in society, that wasn't a role that women were permitted. So it's, you know, what the fact that we're finally able to come out and, and uh, speak our truth and still be loved and not be assaulted is um, a novelty about 20 to 30 years uh, in the making. Like, Think about the big, you know, the women comedians that I really admired um, from the early years, whether it was like Carol Burnett or Tracy Ullman, you know, Gilda Radner. Uh, they were crass body broads. And that wasn't typically what you mother hoped you, what your mother hoped you would grow up to be. <laughs> you yeah. were outside the box, you know, of... Um, the traditional female persona. Women in comedy, like, it's even more rebellious than sort of just, like, the bad girl sex symbol. Yeah, that's, we're sitting here, because I know I'm just opening myself up for all kinds of conversation, which I'm very open to, I love it, uh, around women plus comedy. So, I think, so, because I'm sitting here racking my brain and going, okay, so what early, early stages women were considered comedic. Let's just take Lucille Ball as an example. Her comedy was always couched in uh, a naivete and an innocence. She was a, a goofball, right? She was silly and flaky, and 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 the way she was clever was um, uh, underhanded, or, or or like you know she would get her husband to do something um, by acting silly or dumb, or you know. So there was a. There was a low status aspect to her comedy because she never, she never rose to the extreme of unattractive. So it was, she was still big eyed and, and beautiful and, you know, uh, eyelashes blinking and curls perfect and cute little skirts and, um, you know, red luscious lips. And then she would make her silly faces. Um, but they were silly. They weren't grotesque. So she was within the parameters of attractive and acceptable. Just kind of watching back through the Chaplin clips that I was looking at. The women are, um, ooh, surprised and um, uh, confused and uh, enamored and amused by the men. But they're not the ones making the jokes. They right. are the butt of the joke, not really. Maybe they are affected by the joke, um, but they are maybe kind of a straight men to their sure, absolutely. Um, yeah. So because when Chaplin's with other comedians, they're male. I don't right. see, and I know he casts leading ladies, but he casts them as you know romantic objects right. to be pursued and or um, disappointed by. So even he didn't really know what to do with women. It's, you're, it's, you're absolutely that, correct. Do you think that's true? Okay. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I mean, you know, it's... This is the sad part of the podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, the patriarchy. <laughs> well, it's very true. I mean, I think that it's really fascinating looking at this time of film because in the 1920s, the studio system is developing. Because it was still the Wild West of filmmaking, there are these incredible female figures. Mm -hmm. Chaplin's first director, or mm. it, technically his second director in the film world, yeah. uh, uh, Mabel Normand, was, she did have it all. She was a director, she was incredibly beautiful, and she was like the leading comedian. And was she married with kids? No, well, she tried to marry uh -huh. Max Sinnott. Boom! Here <laughs> we go, folks. Get ready. <laughs> uh, but she ended up being scapegoated uh, 
because she was also sort of this prototypical bad girl. Yeah. Um, loved, yep. loved the Coke. Um, oh. And uh, oh, so she would get into these scrapes at, but, and the studios would conspire against her and blame her for wow. horrible things that were happening, you know, in early days of Hollywood. And uh, she ended up having her career destroyed. Yeah. Because, because you can't, you can't be everything. You can't be all of those things as a woman. That's I don't terrible. know that I, I don't know that you can be, I feel like that's a bit of a, broad stroke but um a little hyperbolic but i it doesn't surprise me yeah you get into a position like that where you're uniquely operating within a male world and how do you maintain that well cocaine helps (laughs) you know (laughs) like how do you maintain it's an ego driven world and a lot of times by nature we are compassionate and caretakers and nurturers and this is a world in which, you know, especially in the comedy world where it's competitive and it's ego driven and it's, I think it's shifting though. That's what I'm really excited about. That's what I try to work on in cla- in the classroom is to, and that's why I love improv is because by its nature, you have to be concerned with the other person. Oh, okay. So recently I was, I have a, a, a very dear friend who is one of the strongest comedians that I know. I mean, from day one, this guy was brilliant, jaw-dropping, fearless, bizarre, crazy, fascinating, incredible performer. But he would say to me, and that his mantra was, every time I go on stage, my number one mission is to have more fun than anybody up there. And you'd watch him play and you'd go, yeah, he's he's off the rails. People would be amazed by him. Oh my God, he's so wild and funny. He was the funniest one up there. And this isn't an improv show. This isn't, there was a series of stand-ups and he was the funniest of them. He's in a group performing with other people and he's over uh, uh, every time being recognized as the funniest one. And he's also the one that most people don't want to play with because he was being selfish on stage. And he finally got to a point because I would kind of drop little ideas and I don't know if it was me or other experiences where he finally one day came in and he went, I think I'm going to change my mantra. I think my mantra is now going to be, I'm going to make sure that you have the best time on stage. And to me, that in its essence is the transition from a male ego dominated comedy world to a more inclusive comedy world where we make sure that each other's voices are lifted up and believe that because of that we have the best possible comedy and what it does is it still it negates the ego which means you may not be the funniest one up there but if you take the whole of the show and own it as a team as opposed to as an individual i think you're gonna have more success i relate to that very deeply yeah. myself when i was in acting school and when i was early in my career I was all, I, yeah, I wanted to dominate. Yeah. I wanted to shine. I wanted to get the credit. Right? Of course. You want, to, you want to win the Oscar. Yeah, exactly. I want to win. Exactly. It's competitive. And as a kid, when you're in that sort of teenage mindset, like that's what you're there for. You know, you want attention. At least I did. We all it, do. Of course. Yeah. That's a huge driving force of why you get into the arts in the first place, mm-hmm. I think. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It feels um, so good to have people's attention on you, doesn't it? Of course. And to this day, when, I mean, if yeah. you want, you want, you want cr- some credit. But everybody <laughs> wants that. Yeah. Everybody wants that. So when you start to realize that your attention has so much value to everyone else, that it's a gift that you give to everyone else. Oh. Exactly. When you can make the connection that the thing you want, you are capable of giving, it is magical. But speaking of. <laughs> Every time I'm about to do my serious transition, I, I love the transition. My transitions didn't work, but um, so <laughs> <laughs> I threw myself off on that one. Where's uh, your flow, man? I'm not gonna let you have it back. In- <laughs> I'm just gonna keep interrupting you. Okay. Selfish performer. Um, and <laughs> well, what we can what we can safely say is that Chaplin did not have this generosity of performance i i believe at Mm. least at this stage of his career sort of where we're at in the story you know he basically he ran the studio with an absolute control 
And he basically wanted to play every part and he only wanted to cast actors that he could mold to like recreate his performances. Interesting. And that's how he built, built things up. You astutely identified the fact that his women were often relegated to very, I don't want to say like subservient or anything like that, yeah. but they were, they were into a certain sort of romantic sexualized mm -hmm. mold right. that fit like what he saw. Yeah. And this speaks to his overall problematic relationships with women, at, yeah. certainly at this time of his life that we get into quite a bit. And this whole episode started with me really having a crisis of conscience and an inability to separate the art from the artist. Mm -hmm. If we were to learn the truth of his behavior in a modern context, you know, he would be decried as a, as a, as a terrible person who you should not support with your dollars, right? And I am really still battling with this issue of like how to separate art from artist. I mean, how do, how do we do this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I, I don't, for some reason, I don't have the same crisis of conscience. And I wonder if that's because I've seen a lot worse. And I also don't know the idea of supporting with dollars person's behavior. I mean, what are we, what are we saying? We, Chaplin's pervasive, like he's not going anywhere. And He's not going to be punished if we take his stuff and don't pay for it because the guy's long gone. And I don't think by appreciating the comedy, we are endorsing child abuse. Like I, I think those are separate. So it's hard for me to wrap my head around it being a, you know, a, a breach of uh, ethics to talk about, observe, appreciate, enjoy chaplin's work you know what it made me think about okay that you know the um the netflix series dahmer mm -hmm. and it, they've done these things a billion times and i'm also a fan of true crime like obsessed with true crime podcasts or i was for a hot minute i really enjoyed them i do love a lot of like documentaries especially the ones on the cults um but for some reason the dahmer documentary that was on netflix it's not a documentary it's a dr dramatized series right it crossed a line for me. Mm. And it was the first time I was disgusted. Like I had a, a feeling of disgust coming up and I had to stop watching it because it occurred to me. And this is, and people are like, oh, well, it, you know, it redeems itself eventually. And, um, you know, because they really focus on the neighbor and the people of color. And I'm like, no, this isn't news that this guy murdered people of color and was a horrific, awful, awful I don't even want to say human being because it just seems inhuman what this person became. And there's no justification for it. We don't watch the childhood and go, oh, I understand. Now there's like trying to elicit compassion in that way. That's not a thing. But the very first episode, you watch a visceral, brutal, carefully detailed reenactment of the final um, attempt at murder that got Dahmer caught. And it's this this young black man, gay black man, and it's horrific. And I thought to myself, uh, I feel like we're capitalizing on the suffering of people of color, like, or, or minorities. Like, I don't, I don't see any, like, this is a direct, unethical breach of benefiting off of the suffering of others. Like, I don't, I don't see how this informs or educates or it's just unsavory entertainment. And, the, and people are like, oh, we'll just send money to the victims. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't think we should watch. This. I don't think this should have been made. It's so gross to me. And to me, that's like a one-to-one -one benefit from the suffering of others. I don't know. I don't know why that's different to me than going, I'm enjoying this Chaplin movie and I'm observing and learning about his artwork and also he abused this woman. Like, I'm not watching him abuse the woman, you know? I'm watching him eat a shoe. I don't, so I, I'm, I'm grappling with it too in terms of wrapping my brain around where I stand on it, but I do think there is a place where the line gets crossed and I don't think it's in understanding and studying Chaplin's work or appreciating it. Oh, well, that brings up so many it brings up a lot of different directions. I'm kind of paused as to sort of where to go. I know, because, right? 
This is big. This is huge. It is huge. And it's a really difficult conversation. And I fully expect us to get to the bottom of it in the next 30 minutes. Solved. Because on the one hand, I think Chaplin, one of the things that's so offensive about him is, is the separation between his art and his personal life. And the fact that he presents himself as this like, aw shucks, innocent humanist and then behaves abhorrently and it's the cognitive dissonance between the Mm. two that it's very upsetting when you learn the truth and that it it makes you angrier at him in a certain sense but what i'm hearing from you is almost the 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 lack of duality in the in the dahmer recreate in the dahmer uh reenactment and sort of the the bald-faced uh uh, exploitation of it that's so that's upsetting to me like if the dahmer documentary had been made strictly from the point of view of the neighbors and strictly from the point of view of the victims and not starring a really cool X-Men actor emoting in front of the camera and doing sexy dances. Like, I'm not, in, I'm not interested in that creature. I am interested in what it felt like to sit in an apartment and hear noises and be confused and, then, and, and be doubted and be gaslit and 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 be scared like that person to me that story's interesting it many ways it gets back to the nature of storytelling and even mm-hmm. those improv lessons that we talked about earlier once upon a time there was a blank who every day did blank right all of a right. sudden you have a protagonist yeah. and we just like the audience watching a character walk on stage and uh, starts to make connections and starts mm-hmm. to tell stories they also inherently start to connect with that protagonist and that is the struggle when telling a story about a character like Dahmer is that by placing him in the protagonist's role, you are already building the empathy yeah. relationship with the audience. And yeah. he, as a, just a sort of s- social political figure within culture, has somehow been transformed into sort of like the OK serial killer as the Ugh. sort of sad boy, kind of uh, yeah. uh, empathetic, closeted, gay kind of figure that like we can relate to and it's like i mean it's it's totally absurd and disgusting but Mm. that's the narrative power of the protagonist right yeah exactly in 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 researching and trying to tell the story of chaplin Mm. i ran into the same problem and why in the last episode i tried to sort of narratively jostle the protagonist roles when discussing these relationships to try to focus on the women in his life just to 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 give us the narrative distance and place him in the in the antagonist role mm. and like allow that baton to be handed off because it's very hard to invest in a protagonist and then watch them do something shitty right. <laughs> and, and not try to uh, relate to it. Well, I think compartmentalizing is a big part of it, right? Because we recognize the path that brought him to this place and we recognize that with power, uh, absolute power, corrupts absolutely you know that there is a there is a cautionary tale here to if you get to a certain point and you're driven entirely by ego and um you cut off more and more of the um sounding boards that allow you to remain human these positions can start to fall apart but that's not the story we're telling what the story we're telling is for you is what is what is the history of film and film is the protagonist Right. So Chaplin is a facilitator of the journey of film, the protagonist, and the point at which he's no longer serving the protagonist. Take a hike, pal. You know, um, the the acts that he's doing, which serve the protagonist film are interesting to me. Hmm. The um, the way in which he was shitty and manipulative towards humanity you know, it's he's I, I don't value him for that. You know, I'm not I'm not. So when you're when you're presenting Chaplin and you're saying like this human did things that no other human did, this is incredible. Um, you know, that's true. He did do things that no other human could do. Um, or at the time he he had a path that was, you know, perfectly laid so that he was like you said, like had had one person been in a different situation, they might have been the one whose name was on the marquee. You know, but the accomplishments that he did are imp- impressive as a human, but what the value that you're bringing to them is what they contribute to the story of film. And him marrying a 16-year-old woman doesn't contribute to the story of film. Um, it's just a sh- crappy person treating, you know, being disrespectful and being corrupted by power. And if you want to go into the psychology of what that does, that's a different podcast. It's 
important to note um, that the human he became changed and that he was a shitty human. Um, but I don't think that that, sh I don't think that by having a conversation about it, you're endorsing it. I had never really considered sort of t that framing of film story as protagonist. film as protagonist. Yeah, that sounds, <laughs> that's the most pretentious podcast ever. I mean, uh, we're trying to make film accessible to people, yeah. relatable even. Yeah. Do you think it's appropriate to try to apply that perspective or even just things uh, that we're learning about Chaplin to modern comedians or, you know, I'm thinking also of like a Dave Chappelle who's like, it's kind yeah. of like started to take these turns that many people find upsetting. Oh, Can yeah. we apply the lessons of the Chaplin story to a modern context or does the perspective of history insulate us? Okay. I think the phrase you used, apply the lessons, is the key here. What you are doing is presenting a story and doing your best to withhold the judgments of the narrator, right? So this is presented as a sort of a documentary educational presentation of film. Hmm. That when you attempt to then present lessons in terms of moral lessons, that's when we start to go astray. I think it's more interesting to share the information and as a human, as a storyteller, present the questions, but don't, it, don't insist upon presenting the answers because the answers are changing, right? So the answers you would have had in the 70s are different from the answers you think you have for yourself now. Um, so if you want this series to feel valuable and timeless, um, you can reflect from your point of view on what's troubling, what questions you have, what things remain unanswered, and what things you know to be true for yourself right now and know to be true in general for, you know, film history. Um, but to sort of lay on the lesson of watch out what power can do, what the ego can do, what being in comedy too long can do, you know. I think that you have to let people decide that for themselves. So even something like a, a Weinstein or a Chappelle, you can report um, and share like these are, you know, he achieved these things. Many people bought his records. Many people laughed at his jokes. That's true. Um, you know, he changed the face of comedy um, by bringing in new perspectives. That's true. Um, was, is he wrong to believe a certain way about transgendered people? Um, and d is that, does that come from his experience in a, you know, being a black male, straight black male? And that gets into the lessons territory for me. Um, I think that there's better people to speak on the authority of how transgender people should be recognized. And there's better people to speak on the authority of what it's like to be a black male than I am. So you can't, so you can only present the information you have and share the questions. Like, is it, you know, why does Dave Chappelle feel empowered to speak in this way? Why do these words affect certain groups? Um, you know, what are the, what are the ramifications of that? Uh, does it change the way I enjoy his comedy? I think those are great questions. I think trying to present the answers can, is where we start to get into the muddy waters. In that example, I does don't, it change the way you... I love Chappelle's earlier work. I don't think the transgender stuff is funny. It kind of grosses me out. It makes me uncomfortable. But I also don't love comedy that makes that is cruel to people and i experience those jokes as cruel that kind of humor has had and has had a life span and i don't know how much longer it will go on but i will say as a modern comedian um there have i've had challenges with trying to shift the kind of jokes i do um self-deprecating humor over sexualized humor Greta Gerthammer, my character in D&D, &D, is lawful horny, you know, and I revel in this sort of <laughs> sexual freedom that she has. But that's only about two small steps away from oh, women are allowed to like sex, which was a big revelation for me in the 90s, you know, <laughs> 20 years later. It's getting a little tired, you right. know, and me being dirty and body and talking about my bush on stage 
is starting to feel a little stale for me. Um, so I'm excited to find what's next. And also, I'm afraid I won't be funny in the next iteration. I think I probably will be. Um, I always tell my students, comedians are always at the front of the march and the back. <laughs> We're always the first ones to try to to discover the problems um, with, you know, society's perspectives. And we're always the last ones to stop joking about it. <laughs> so God bless you, Gallagher. Uh, <laughs> sort of the reason why I even mentioned whatever I said about, you know, voting with your dollars or that's mm, that yeah, sort of yeah. mentality is so I'm having this experience with Louis CK right now, who yeah. obviously like went through this whole like public backlash for his like sexual behavior. Yeah. Then like I tried to watch one of his specials mm -hmm. uh a couple years ago and found it like totally unfunny found it totally falling <laughs> flat yeah then just a month ago i saw the trailer for his like most recent uh special that's like yeah. on his website he's it was back. 10 10 minutes yeah he's back and it's like i called i'm sorry or like something like that some sort yeah. of cheeky title and yeah. uh the 10 minutes that i saw i thought was hilarious and it I made mean, me it laugh again but then yeah, I'm faced with the problem of it's not like Dave Chappelle where it's just on Netflix that I already paid for and I can like press play or not. <laughs> it's yeah. all for sale on his website. So right. now the question is, am I going to fork over the ten dollars for his special? And, and does that make and, me a woman hating or uh, you know sexual harassment denier? It's just yeah, I, I guess it's it's just it's a weird question that I hate that we have to ask because it's like I don't want to view people just as pure commodities. I don't want to view people like mm. movies on Letterbox where I'm giving them a five star rating as to whether or not I approve of their behavior. And yet that's also the world we live in. And also we all have to be given space to grow and learn and change and get better. We and to be forever punished by a, a series of acts that you may or may not continue to perpetuate, you know, is horrifying for a lot of us artists to think like, oh God, what if they find that thing and then I'm not allowed to do my art anymore? Yeah. That cancel culture concept. To me, I think, you know, I think Louis is going to be okay. He's an incredibly talented brilliant comedian he really is a brilliant writer um and a very funny performer i think if uh the value of his on-screen persona lowers to the point where it's no longer worth um the capitalists uh, investing in him he'll find other ways to make his comedy work um i don't know that the bell has told for him I just think that if we're so concerned about people being punished for a singular act or a singular series of choices, and that's our biggest concern, I feel like focusing our energy on fixing the prison system is like, you know, it's like, to me, it's perspective. I think leave people to decide for themselves whether or not they want to, they think Louis funny and they want to watch him. Um, let people decide for themselves. I, to me, I don't really care that much um i am way more concerned with sort of the bigger issues of you know how we treat and punish people um that are marginalized versus this one successful person um i, I think it's an interesting conversation but i to me i just i i separate that act from the art and i watch the art and i'm not entertained by it because i just don't really relate to that perspective and if his acts were bad enough i probably I'm not interested in watching it. But like, am I never going to rent a Weinstein movie? I don't even know which ones they are. He's touched everything. And they were a whole lot more people involved in that than just him. So it just, it becomes a complicated conversation. And for me, separating the art from the person is the simplest way to deal with that. Shoot me down. I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I have no shots to fire. I think that one of the great, one of the, amazing things about history is that we do get to watch our own behavior play out over time many uh pundits will decry you know cancel culture mm. as some sort of like new invention it's not. yeah and it's not no in, in any way shape or form and it doesn't really have that's what i think is the point is is i it it only has a certain amount of power and it has the power that people give it internally you know so if someone is so paranoid about being canceled 
great. Maybe check and see why, <laughs> you know, um, because it's, I think there are certain situations in which it's, it's become egregious, but for the most part, I think, I think the water rises to the, what is it level? You know, it all sort of, it all sort of settles, <laughs> balances out eventually anyway. Yeah. It's That's what you get from being a comedian for 20 plus years is you, you see the ebbs and flows of it. Um, and you see people rise medi meteorically and then settle in and settle back down. And I've, you know, I've, been dear friends with many, many comedians um, over time who came in gangbusters and were just undeniably funny and brilliant. And they're still working. They're just not super famous or, you know, they're in Vegas or they're doing prices right now or, you know, like it's, it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint and cancel culture is about the sprint, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the end did we do it i think i did think we, we did it thing? let me let me try to like let me try to segue us out but don't don't interrupt you <laughs> no don't look, even look at me I don't... okay don't look at me while i'm segueing yeah. Shh, look away <laughs> i'm about to do my segue i i would be it's easier to pee in front of people than segue in front of people it seems to be <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today it's been amazing to talk to you and uh, i hope we get to do this again i mean there hopefully the pod will keep going on and there'll be ample opportunities for us to uh i mean it's all you keep talking that is a shit ton of work that you've got to do to keep this podcast going so i hope that you find the resources to keep going because i think it's worth it and then we can come back and we can have like a um you know like they have talking dead where they talk about the walking dead after the walking dead We'll probably have a second podcast where you and I talk about your podcast, Talking Behind the Slate. <laughs> <laughs> behind Behind the Slate. <laughs> Under Behind the Slate. <laughs> Under Down Below, Behind Behind the Slate. Between the Slate. Between the Slate. <laughs> the between the Slates. Oh, that's good. I'm keeping that one. It's sold. I hope we get to do that. Me too. Um, but. Until then, yes. Thank you so much. Is there anything that you want to plug right now? Where can um, people find you? Where can people? Yes, find you? the thing that um, I'm plugging, if you've made it to the end of this podcast, is uh, that I am developing television under the banner of a company called Dagger Originals, D A G G E R Originals, DaggerOriginals.com. And if you find me there and you have an interesting personal story and or a gangbuster script that people aren't reading and you wish they would um then reach out to me and maybe we can make some television happen okay okay we gotta wrap to go to work. okay okay tara has to go to work thank you so much for joining us and until next time that's a wrap bye, bye.